ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul. Whatever thou be, until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to the first scared to death of 2022. Creeps, peepers, Roberts, and Annabelle's. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, singular. I, singular. I know how to Good say job. now. I'm a, I'm a big boy. It's just one new year. Yeah. 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 Singular. I, I think it's because people say New Year's Eve, mm-hmm. and so people just end up saying Happy New Year's. I mean, yes. <laughs> happiness for all your years. For all the years. Yes. I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello. Uh, new Year, new merch. Uh, entomophobia is an extreme and persistent fear of insects. Oh, I think I have that. It's what referred. It's what's referred to as a specific phobia, which is a phobia that focuses on a particular object, and uh, and that theme carries over into the take my hand tea in the Bad Magic store. Cool. So uh, visit badmagicmerch.com for weekly merch drops, Annabelle exclusives, and yeah, it's uh, it's good and creepy shirt, definitely for the creepers. Okay. Or the, the creeps. The creeps or the creepers. I know it goes both. Mm-hmm. The creepettes. Maybe that's creepettes. like a, maybe a creepette is a oh, female creeper. Creepette. A creeper and a creepette. Uh, it also sounds like a crepe. So now we're like <laughs> getting into food. I'm starving. Uh, the first Bad Magic Productions charity of 2022 going to be Love Thy Neighbor. Uh, we met the lovely ladies who run this 501c3 nonprofit, primarily serving the Denver area. Uh, when I was there last time doing shows at Comedy Works, mm-hmm. we both met them. Um, working with these gen- working with generous local businesses, they hand out free food to the homeless. Also give uh, clothing, shoes, blankets, etc. Distribute that to the homeless. Uh, literally keep people alive by mm-hmm. supplying both food and clothing to people. Uh, you know, uh, without homes in a very cold city. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was great to talk to them. I mean, it's always fantastic when you can make that mm-hmm. personal connection. But the thing that we were talking about too is that homelessness doesn't always look the way you think. It looks. It's yeah. not just yeah. the person crawling into their tent on the side of the freeway. It's also like, you know, the person that you work with that is sleeping out of their car. Mm-hmm. It, home, homelessness comes in a variety of forms. And uh, what do they call it? Like housing insecure, like food insecurity. Right. It's all part of what they're they're working on. And it was just. They were really cool. Yeah, they were really cool. Doesn't one of them play. She plays football. Right? for uh There's a um, women's football league that has a team in Denver. Um, and she is, God, what'd she say? I think she's, uh, she's defense. I know, but I want to say like a, a defensive back. I could, I can't remember. Or a linebacker. But, but collectively they she were was, just, she was passionate about that and passionate about, uh, the charity. Yeah. Yeah. Collectively, they were just a really cool group of people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, these small charities, it's so rewarding to give to them because mm-hmm. you know that it's going to go so much further than it does for some giant charity that gets money from everyone absolutely so to find out more uh you know and or donate yourself you can go to ltnsocks.com because they uh they give socks to certain donor donors another little fun thing they do yeah it's cute uh and now some uh show info how many stories do you have today i have lulu i have two (laughs) doo-doo doo-doo danny doo-doo oh okay remember all right don't you remember okay it was just last year all right fine (laughs) <laughs> what are your two about <laughs> oh man okay well my first story will be like a short but not so sweet story okay uh lucid dream maybe right. lucid dream possibly confirmed by somebody else like that oh no that happened okay. which is a very interesting take on that kind of dream yeah and then actually i have a, a longer story that has spooky elements mm-hmm. but it's more of a like interesting kind of ghost that i had never heard of before okay and uh it sticks with you, a, a house ghost, which I've quite literally never heard that term. Interesting. So we'll dive into that. Uh, I have my standard two. Going to get weird and scary to start with, uh, with the Alaskan legend of the Kushtika. Uh, some kind of soul-snatching cryptid. Okay. Might mess you up uh, how cute you think otters are. Then the next story will take us to your home state of Ohio. Just out, yeah, just outside of Lancaster, uh-huh. uh, which is uh, just a little bit southeast of Columbus. Okay. Uh, to hear the legend of the Mud House Mansion. Hmm. This creepy house no longer there, but dark legends remain of what may have once happened inside the home, and uh, and I'll be telling one of those legends today. I thought that there is a Lancaster, Michigan, and I believe there's, there's a also, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I was just going to say that, so I actually didn't know that there was a Lancaster, Ohio. It's like five ten miles outside of uh, Columbus, outside hmm. of the suburbs. Kind of sea bus. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, well, you, you know, any excuse to go to Ohio. <laughs> you ready to begin? I am. I've got on some minty fuzzies. Okay. Because they match my minty shirt. You, you see do. what's happening? Mm-hmm. Hmm? Now I'm ready to get cozy. I want a bowl of mint ice cream. Oh, mint chocolate chip ice cream. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there we mm. go. Uh, <laughs> according to northern legends from southern Alaska, the Kushtika are shape-shifting creatures. Half man, half otter. Not a combo that's probably going to immediately strike fear into anyone's hearts when that's all you hear. When you think of an otter, you probably think of a cute, water-loving little creature known for floating on its back, eating shellfish. But the Kushtika is uh, not some cute little creature. A large, bigger-than-a-man, uh, soul-stealing shapeshifter. The original story comes from the folklore of the Tlingit people of coastal Alaska. Tlingit legend says that uh, as you're walking through your village, hunting in the woods, or fishing in the sea... A man or a group of men you've never seen before may approach you, men who look like your kinsmen, but they're monsters, and by the time you realize that they're kushtika, it's too late. In some cases, the creature uh, may appear when you're lost or injured, promising rescue. Instead of helping you, though, they lead you deeper into the wilderness, farther and farther from any source of help before eventually tearing you into pieces. The kushtika is a cryptid similar in many ways to skinwalkers. Mm. Those American Indian shape-shifting legends that typically appear blended with the wolf, the kushtika can appear as an otter, man, or a mix of both. Like skinwalkers, they can mimic the noises of friends and loved ones to lure you to your doom. The Kushtika can also steal your soul. Scary creature, but the Kushtika can be stopped. For centuries, people have claimed to ward them off with copper, dogs, and fire. The following is an old story from the 1930s, recovered in a journal that the author thought was going to be forgotten forever. Time now for the tale of the Kushtika. July, 2016. The old, hel- the old house felt suffocating. Katrina felt as if decades of memories were pressing down on her at once. The tense atmosphere of grief was magnifying those memories. Katrina's great-grandfather, Walter, had passed away just a week ago. He lived a very long and eventful life. He was 103 when he died. Katrina never knew him well, but some of her aunts and uncles were deeply affected by his loss. Katrina and her parents made the 36-hour journey from Anchorage to Ketchikan. Driving into the small town felt like stepping into another world a world frozen in time and full of old traditions. They were here to attend the funeral and help clean out Walter's house, a task that required many people. Walter was a bit of a hoarder. Katrina secretly thought to herself, every nook and cranny was packed with books, trinkets, and tools. Walter lived the last 20 years of his life alone. His wife, great-grandma Christine, died in 1996. Katrina wondered if he ever got lonely, being so isolated from everyone. She thought to herself that it must have made him a bit of an oddball with an obsession for dogs and copper. The family had to rehome Walter's three massive dogs, old beasts who were sweet but barked at the slightest sounds. Walter's dog obsession didn't end with his real pets. He also had dog statues all over his porch and yard, painted in lifelike fashions. Definitely strange, in Katrina's opinion. And all the copper. Copper bells lined the porch, copper plates, bowls, cups strewn all over the place. Every person had strange habits and fascinations, but Walter's were stranger than most. Trina was assigned to go through Walter's bedroom closet. She was supposed to throw away old clothes and make a donation pile. Easy enough. She just put on her headphones, listened to music while she completed her task. She was a little worried about what she might find in the old man's closet. But after an hour of sorting, she fell into an easy rhythm. Trina grabbed up a massive pile of donations to carry downstairs. The ends of some shirts knocked into her phone, which she placed on a nightstand and sent it flying on the floor and skidding under the bed. She sighed, put her shirts down, laying on her stomach and stretching her arm out to reach the phone. A loose floorboard now caught Katrina's eye. Being the curious person she was, she crawled further under the bed, grabbed her phone, used the flashlight to see into the dark space. A red journal was tucked into the gap in the floor. Interesting. Katrina checked for any wandering spiders, gingerly reached into the gap pulling out the dusty journal. Was this Walter's secret diary? Katrina felt like she was invading the old man's privacy, but she was also filled with a burning curiosity to open it up, and it's not like he would ever know. She brushed off some of the dust, flipped through it, not bothering to read quite yet. Walter had only filled up about a third of the pages. Why had he hidden it in his floorboard, she wondered. Was it full of secrets? Katrina flipped it open to the first page. 1938. I, Walter Florence Reed, do solemnly swear that I am writing nothing but the truest facts. The events I endured when I was a young man of 25 changed my life forever. I can tell no one what happened. I've prayed for answers and come to the conclusion that the best thing for me to do is write about it. 
to help get the story out of my head and to make sure I never forget the details. And then I will hide this journal forever. Perhaps someone after I'm dead will read it and share it. Maybe that will help someone else feel less alone, less crazy. I'd share it now, but I'm afraid no one would believe me. They might think I'm acting like a crank for attention. And Ketchikan is far too small of a town I plan on living in for far too long for that kind of unwanted attention. Katrina jumped and oh, Katrina jumped when she heard footsteps approaching. Acting on instinct, she tucked the journal into the back of her jeans, pulling her shirt over it. She didn't want to show anyone what she found. Are you finished, her mother asked, poking her head into the room. Yep, Katrina answered, grabbing up her donation pile and heading downstairs. Katrina waited eight agonizing hours to be able to read the journal. She had to endure more cleaning, a painfully long family dinner, and a fireside chat with her aunts and uncles. All she could think about was the journal she'd hidden in her bag. At 11.30, Katrina fake yawned and stretched. Well, I'm going to bed. Good night, everyone. She waved goodbye to her family, who she knew would be up for at least another hour. Katrina knew she wouldn't be sleeping for quite a while. She crawled into bed, turning on the lamp next to her, pulling, old, pulling out the old red journal. Time to find out what secrets Walter took with him to his grave. Katrina felt chills down her spine. She worried she was about to find out something terrible about Walter. But she had to know what secrets he might be hiding. She opened the journal again. I had just been hired on a fishing boat. My crew consisted of myself and five men. Captain Johnson, Ronald, Albert, Clarence, and Nod Kim or Nod. The man was of Tlingit people. He told us simply to call him Nod. All of us agreed that Nod was an odd man. He had strange superstitions that mystified us, but no one dared to ask to risk offending him. He performed a blessing ritual on himself and our ship each morning before we started our day's work. He always offered us the blessing, but we refused. How I wish we would have accepted. Ronald, my crewmate and new friend, told me that when Nod was hired a year previous, he had insisted to Captain Johnson that the ship needed a copper plate on the bow. Johnson tried to refuse, but the argument between the men escalated to the point of shouting. Johnson conceded because Nod was a skilled fisherman and brought in a healthy catch every day. If the man wanted copper on the bow, he'd get it. Over time, the copper had been added to the stern and inside the small captain's cabin. I adjusted quickly to the daily routine on the ship and to Nod's rituals. I noticed that in addition to the copper on the ship, he wore a copper amulet around his neck. One day, I felt compelled to ask Nod about his behavior. We were both on our lunch break, leaning against the ship and peering into the water below us. Say, Nod, why do you wear that amulet around your neck each day? He hesitated, looking around warily before turning to face me. Kushtaka. What is a kush... Quiet, he hissed. What is a kushtaka? I asked in a whisper. Again, he hesitated. He swallowed nervously before answering. An evil creature. Pray to your god that you never meet one. You won't survive if you do. He left me alone, pondering what he told me. I'd never heard of this kushtaka before. It sounded like a ridiculous superstition to me, but the way Nod was afraid to even say the name out loud did make me curious. I continued peering into the water for the duration of my break. At one point, I could have sworn I saw a flash of movement in the water, quick as lightning. I brushed it off as a trick in my mind. I wish I hadn't. Things continued as normal for another few months. I got up each dawn each day to join the crew on the ship. We fished all day, brought in our catch, went home in the dark. The routine was monotonous, and the winds were harsh on the best days, brutal on the worst, but the job gave me the money I needed to support my family. The men and I formed a bond that can only come from spending hours together isolated on the water. Only Nod seemed apart from the group. I tried to befriend him by inviting him to play cards with us, but he preferred to be alone, peering anxiously into the water, pacing the ship. After a few months fishing with this crew, a foggy morning in March changed my life forever. The day started as all do. I woke up, headed out into the cold darkness to the ship, joined my crew, and set out on the water. This day felt different somehow. The chill in the air seemed worse, cutting into my skin, to my clothes. Things seemed to go wrong at every turn. I broke a lantern, ropes unraveled, men slipped on the decks. Almost an entire net of fish didn't meet quality standards and had to be tossed. By the end of the day, we were all angry, terse, and eager to go back home. Nod seemed especially worried this day. He paced and paced, rubbing his copper amulet repeatedly. We had just begun the journey home. We were still far from the docks, cruising along the shore. I could see a small cove with woods above it. I had no memory of seeing this place before. I was lost in my thoughts when a shrill cry pierced the air. A woman's scream echoed all around us. Every man perked up at once, scanning for the source of the noise. We all raced to the sides of the ship, peering into the water below, and the woman screamed again. Ronald! Help! 
I watched horror fill, fill Ronald's eyes. His skin turned white. A bead of sweat dripped down his forehead. Sue! He screamed, looking around frantically, running from one side of the ship to the other, looking out into the distant woods. There was no one there, but Sue continued screaming, Ronald! Save me! My wife! That's my wife! Help me save her! Ronald shucked off his heavy jacket and boots, climbing onto the edge of the ship, readying himself to dive into the cold water. Nod jerked him back. Let go of me, you bastard! That's my wife out there! Captain Johnson intervened. Break it up now! Ronald, we all hear her, but you can't go jumping into that water. We need to find this woman first. Ronald shook his head. I have to go! She needs me! The woman screamed again, a terrible, frightful sound that echoed all around us. You can't go out there, Nod shouted. This was the first time I'd ever hear, heard him use such a tone. That is not your wife! Ronald pulled, uh, pulled back an arm and tried, so and tried socking him in the jaw, but Nod ducked a punch and then grabbed Ronald by his shirt and pulled him in close, nose to nose. That is not your wife, he yelled again sternly into his face as Captain Johnson grabbed Ronald from behind in a bear hug, pinning his arms. It's a Kushtaka, Nod said. The word sent a chill down my spine. Kushtaka, Captain Nod continued. We need to leave immediately. Take us home as fast as you can. Captain Johnson must have known about the Kushtaka, or he must have sensed Nod's sincerity because he looked scared before nodding that yes, he would take us home. I believed him too. I had a feeling that if we didn't leave soon, we'd never make it home. Johnson now let go of Ronald and raced to the captain's cabin. He turned on the ship's engine, and we began floating away from the island, increasing our speed by the second. No! Ronald shouted as Nod stood between him and the side of the boat. His wife's scream echoed as we drifted away. Ronald! Ronald! she cried. Ronald pushed Nod to the side, climbed up onto the edge of the ship again, and without a moment's hesitation, dived into the freezing water and began swimming towards the cove. Ronald, come back! I called after him, but he ignored our shout, swimming determinately to the cove. Once again, Captain Johnson slowed the ship. I could see the anger on his face. Once we got Ronald back on board, if we got him back on board, I knew he'd be leaving the ship without a job. We watched silently as Ronald swam towards his destination, and then suddenly, he disappeared from our view. He slipped under the water, hands flailing for a moment before his hands sunk under as well, and he never came back up. Moments passed. We waited with bated breath for him to come back. Streaks of red appeared on the surface instead, pale at first, then blooming into a giant scarlet cloud. Blood. Our shout started up once again. A few men prepared to jump overboard and pull Ronald from the water, try and find his body, but Nod stopped them. It's the Kushtika! You'll all die if you go in there! Nod ran into the captain's cabin, speaking frantically with Johnson for a moment. I saw the captain's face shift from shock to horror to determined resignation. He nodded and began turning the wheel as hard as it could go, taking us away from Ronald. Nod returned, arms full of copper trinkets, a plate, cups, another amulet. He ordered us to take an object into our hands and never let go until we were safely out of sight of the cove. We all stood in silent shock. No one dared to speak for fear that the creature might return and drag one of us off the ship. My heart ached to leave my friend, but if Nod was telling the truth, it was a death wish to enter the water when the Kushtika was near. We had just seen a horrifying example for ourselves. Johnson got us out into op open water. A few of the town lights soon shined back at us, promising home and safety. The sun was starting to set, sinking low into the sky. The thought of being on the water with the creatures that lurked beneath terrified me. Cap Captain Johnson came down from his place at the wheel, a somber look on his face. Men, he began, we can't save Ron, but we can't dishonor him by leaving his body behind. He deserves a proper burial. Nod has told me a way that it will be safe for us to go back. I understand I'm asking a lot of you. If you wish to go home, I'll take you back to the docks. No questions asked. But if you wish to go retrieve Ronald's body, we go now. Nod said it's best to go before the... Well, before the creature drags him far away. All of us exchanged a look of trepidation. Did I want to go back to that awful place? No. But Ronald was my friend. And Susan, the real Susan, deserved to give her husband a proper burial. I'll go, I said. And the others followed my lead. Not explain what we would do while Johnson took us back to the dreaded cove. He said, We must kill the Kushtika, or it will continue to steal more men. Every day on the water I've looked for one, but have seen no signs until this day. We must get rid of it. How? Clarence asked. The Kushtika can be killed with any weapon, but we must attract it to us first. How might we do that? I asked. But I already knew the answer. Human bait. One of us must get into the water. The rest of us will ready ourselves to shoot... We cannot wear copper or use any fire. The Kushtika will be scared away. Whoever volunteers must go with no protection. A long silence followed. Johnson idled us closer and closer to the cove. The time for a decision was now. I'll do it, I said, for Ronald. And so the plan was made. I was to go out into the water to lure the Kushtika. 
There were two guns on the ship. Johnson and Clarence would shoot while Nod and Albert would hold knives and attack if the shots failed. Their job was to quickly help me back into the ship once the Kushtika appeared, if it didn't kill me first. I refused to allow myself to think of what I was about to do or what monster I was about to face. My stomach turned nervously when I saw the cove in the distance. Johnson idled closer and closer to the shallow water where I was to get out and face the Kushtika. It's time, Nod said, placing a hand on my shoulder. I could only nod. Words failed me in that moment. I was handed a knife, but I knew it wouldn't matter much if I was attacked. And then I was lowered into the lifeboat, and I paddled close to shore. Fear overwhelmed me, but I forced myself to push forward to think of my purpose. All I had to do now was wait. Agonizing minutes of silence passed. In an effort to speed things up, I began humming old hymns to myself. It served a dual purpose, comfort and attracting the Kushtika. A moment later, I heard a tiny splash and felt water ripple towards the boat. My heart seized up for a moment. The breath left my lungs. It was here. Now was time to enact the plan. I began rowing back towards the boat as fast as I could, arms pumping furiously as I imagined the monster shooting up out of the water, grabbing me before pulling me in. I heard another splash, closer this time. I checked my place in the water I was within shooting distance. Ready yourselves, I called to my crew, hoping my voice would carry. And then I saw it. My voice died as I watched it emerge, first the strange, snout-like nose, otter face, soulless black eyes. It stood to its full height, at least two men tall. I watched it swing massive arms out of the water, claws arcing towards me. Bang! 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 The Kushtika fell, red, splattering into the water. I wasted no time rowing the rest of the way back to the boat. The men pulled me up. I sat shaking on the deck. Although I was utterly exhausted, our mission wasn't finished yet. We retrieved the monster's creature in a net, dragged it to shore. We all took a moment to inspect it. The Kushtika was like nothing I'd seen before, an odd combination of otter and man, mutant features. We located Ronald's body on the shore of the cove then. It's a horrifying sight, too difficult for me to even recall on paper. The creature had destroyed his remains. Nod told us we needed to burn the Kushtika now to ashes, scatter them across the shore. If we didn't, it might come back to life somehow. We spent hours watching flames destroy this monster's carcass until nothing but the bones remained. Nod told us to each take one. A Kushtika bone is an ultimate symbol of protection from more of their kind. We returned home at dawn, different men than when we left. For weeks after, I couldn't sleep. I had vivid nightmares of the Kushtika grabbing me, pulling me down into the ocean depths. Now my story is complete. I will try to put it from my mind, but I know my memories will haunt me forever. Katrina closed the journal. Her hands shook. She had a hard time focusing on her surroundings. She felt like she'd been there, watching the whole thing, only to be snapped back into reality by the tale's abrupt end. The story was crazy. Absurd. Ridiculous. Laughable, even. It had to be fake. Her great-grandpa had to be crazy. Yet she knew in her heart it was all real. Every word. He was never known to be a man who told crazy stories. And he waited to tell this one until after he was dead. Why do it if that was a lie? Katrina wasn't sure what to do. She knew she wouldn't share the secrets with her family, but she felt like she had to maybe share the journal, get the word out there. She decided to post the story online, hoping to clear her mind to do it for Walter. After that, she chose to take Walter's advice and try her best to never think of the Kushtika ever again. Interesting. Yeah, very different kind of story. Yeah. I'd never heard of that creature before this uh, story came along. Me either, but now I feel like I need one of its bones just to be on the safe side. <laughs> I can put it next to the ball of copper that's on my bedside table. Yeah. And then I'll be I'll be good. Yeah, I'm surprised. I mean, I did an episode on Time Suck of Skinwalkers, and I, uh, I know that there was lore. Like, there's a lot of different tribal variations on skinwalkers and so maybe i came across but it didn't it didn't ring familiar well it did, doesn't feel like a skinwalker uh, i wouldn't classify them in the same way i mean it's uh like the folklore is very similar where it's a shapeshifter that can mimic voices yeah and, you know like an animal human hybrid possibly but yeah interesting with the interesting how that legend is actually very prevalent amongst tribes all across north america mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and, and usually based on like you know what animal is in that area Right. And uh, and I have some pictures okay. that you're going to like. I could not find scary uh, Kushtika artwork that wasn't obviously copywritten, but I found a lot of cute otter pics. So here's one. <gasps> oh, cute baby. I forgot how cute they are. They're so cute. It's got uh, like a Gigi nose. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Look at weird, like furry little people. Almost. I like its little, I like its hands. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. This next one is two of them uh, oh, being extra being so cute. cute? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh buddies. snuggles. Snuggling up in the water. Come on. And then I tried to find a picture of an angry otter to have one looking oh, yeah. What'd fierce. Oh, yeah, what'd you get? What'd you get? Even, it's just more cute than the previous two pictures. 
He's, it's like he's put, putting up his dukes to fight. Come on, I'll get you. He's so cute. So cute. He's got to be even smiling a bit. I know. It's ridiculous how expression their expressions. Oh and then this last one, this is the cutest yet. This is ridiculous. I didn't know this was possible, daughters. See that little rock? Uh, yeah. Asian small clawed otters will shift small, small stones swiftly from paw to paw, and it looks like they're juggling. Oh, my God. And scientists have no idea why they do it. They thought at first it was for dexterity, but it seems like they're just kind of dicking around. They're just having fun. Yeah. They're entertaining themselves. Yeah. Just, just you know, tossing a stone back and forth in their little paws. How funny. What a, yeah, what a funny little thing. I still like the put them up paws. Mm -hmm. I like that guy. Little now, boxer. Now, are otters aggressive towards humans? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure like most animals, if they were cornered, yeah. they would try to bite or scratch to defend themselves. But no, there's, I mean, they're little and I think, I mean, I'm 99.9% .9 certain that they, if you come close, they just try to run away. I mean, a lot of little animals like that. Yeah, yeah. If you're um, between, if they're between like you and they're young, mm -hmm. I'm sure, sure they're going to be more aggressive. But no, I've never heard like... Watch out for otters. Yeah, yeah. And I was just thinking, like, raccoons are so cute, but they're super aggressive. Hippos, yeah. so cute. They will eat you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hippos got some size to throw around. I know. Uh, Oof. And, but I've never heard, like, the similar stories. Like, I know raccoons, I mean, they don't really come for you, but they want your garbage. They want your food. They they're not afraid to be confrontational. Yeah, they're, they're a little more confrontational than the average small creature. Yeah, yeah. So I was just wondering. Yeah, I don't think the temperament's the same with the otters. Because it's so cute. True. I don't want it to be angry. I know. Raccoons are like, because they got little hands. I know. Raccoon oh, paws. Raccoon, pa, raccoon paws. I know. One of my, <laughs> my many nicknames, raccoon paw, bird shoulder. <laughs> True. <laughs> something, there was something else that ended up going, Monroe added onto that oh, at some funny. point. I forgot. Oh, jeez. <sighs> oh, dear. I'm the butt of so many jokes in our house. Oh, man. Ay, ay, ay. Well, that's an interesting story. And I'm actually surprised we didn't come across it. More re like in other stories or more yeah. frequently, I was gonna say recently, more frequently because it feels like folklore of like fishermen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I just can't believe because what, what was that like Lake what? Lanier? Like we've like we've gone oh, to lakes. Yeah. There have been things about like haunted lakes or haunted bodies of water, mm -hmm. and it feel. I mean, this would it's tribal folklore. Yeah, I guess it goes back centuries and centuries. I mean, goes, yeah. we don't know how far it goes back because it's it goes back into the oral tradition. You never know how long those carry backwards. But yeah, from sure. that Tlingit people. Yeah. Who were, uh, you know, a tribe based uh, on fishing largely. Right. Yeah. 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 You ready to, you ready to move away from uh, an otter monster and towards something uh, weird still, but more traditional? Okay, sure. Okay. The Haunted Mudhouse Mansion. Mudhouse? A little bit of setup on this one. And just so it's not confusing, uh, nobody knows how the name Mudhouse Mansion came to be. So don't ask. Yeah. It's just like one of those things like. At some point, somebody started calling it that, and then it stuck, and then other people, and then somebody wrote about it, and then it really right. stuck. It was like no one's last name. It just no, kind of... No, There's no, like, uh, it doesn't seem to be. Okay. You're looking around. Uh, these days, most information, easily accessible to us via the internet, public records, some other venue. There's nearly no place. Notes, um, you know, we can't look up online, or no place, you know, uh, with uh, notes we can't look up online, quickly discover its history. Determine a building's former occupants, for example. Use the details we find to maybe explain why the location might just feel off and not be haunted. But despite the quick and easy amateur sleuthing capabilities of our modern technological world, sometimes places still pretty mysterious. Sometimes people can't quite pin down what happened and why, why the place is called what it is. One of those places is Mudhouse Mansion. Almost every detail we know about the mansion riddled with mystery. Uh, it was built sometime in the late 1800s on a little hill just outside of Lancaster, Ohio. Um, or maybe sometime in the early 1800s, maybe in 1839, maybe 1852, maybe some date in between or later. Uh, Christian and Eleanor Ruh purchased the property from Abraham K.G. and Henry Byler is the most commonly told story. Uh, the house appeared for the first time that we know of definitively in writing in the 1875 Fairfield County Atlas on a 270-acre parcel owned by William Pugh. Sold in the 1920s to the Hartman family, whose descendants are still the owners of the property, though the name is switched with an inheritance. Uh, not long after the family took possession, sometime in the 1930s, the house slipped into abandonment and in the ensuing years reportedly played host to a number of transients. Like any derelict home, especially one with an ominous, foreboding look, a number of creepy tales soon were centered around Mudhouse Mansion. In fact, just about the only thing that is certain about the mysterious estate is that it was, uh, is that it was demolished on September 21st, 2015, at the instruction of current owner Jeannie Mast. Why would she destroy this home that had been in her family for generations? According to Jeannie, 
the burden of owning a home with so much folklore associated with it was just too much. She said that thrill seekers routinely broke in through the windows, vandalized the inside. The genie ended up having to hire night guards or watch for trespassers herself to try and keep people away. And then David Mass, Jeannie's son, said the house just wasn't their style anymore. And he didn't want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to make the place safe, updated, and livable. He claims that he's never understood people's fascination with the house or where the haunted stories come from. And maybe that's all true and legitimate. Maybe the family just didn't want the house enough to deal with the hassle of keeping it. Maybe it didn't make any financial sense. Or maybe they're hiding something. Some think the masks aren't necessarily telling the whole truth. They think maybe the masks were worried that anyone who went into the house might not come back out alive. And not because it was an old, dangerously dilapidated structure. These people think that the Mudhouse Mansion has had other non-transient inhabitants. That some former owners, or at least one former owner, might still have been living there. An inhabitant no longer from this world who left them no choice but to finally demolish the house because they refused to get out. Time now for the tale of the mysterious Mudhouse Mansion. The first entry in the book of the Mudhouse Mansion lore tells of an abusive post-Civil War era slave owner who lived on the property. Given that Ohio outlawed slavery in 1802, this might seem odd, and that has led some people to discount this strange story. But in 19th century America, freedom was less of a definitive category in many places, more of a spectrum. Despite slavery's uh, illegality, there are documented cases of white settlers forcing black adults and children, some of whom were former slaves, into involuntary labor north of the Ohio River as indentured servants. Other slaves brought across the river may have been and probably were on occasion coerced to remain under the control of their owners under threat of being sent back to a slave state. And some slaves may have agreed to do this because this version of slavery was comparably preferable to the kind south of the Mason-Dixon line. If this following story is true, well, one night this violent master apparently went too far with his abuse. We don't know exactly what kind of torture he inflicted upon the poor man, but a few hours later the enslaved man escaped his quarters, crept through a series of underground chambers that led to the home's basement. And then he entered the home and murdered the slave owner while he slept along with the man's entire family according to this story. The house then lay vacant for years afterwards, with neighbors hearing strange shrieks, groans coming from within the empty mansion. No one dared to enter the building, wondering if the inhabitants still believed they were alive, if they would attack anyone who entered, thinking it might be their killer. The Mudhouse Mansion has also been rumored to be the original home of the infamous urban legend Bloody Mary. Some kids in nearby Lancaster, Ohio, grew up calling it the House of Mary, According to another story, neighbors watched a family move into the mud house one day, several years after the alleged murders of the first family took place. Three children, parents, all unloading their belongings. And at the end of the day, they disappeared behind the doors, and then they never came back out. Not ever. Not alive. Neighbors literally never saw them again. Not outside the house, at least. In the first days that followed the family moving in, the neighbors rationalized the disappearances as odd, but not unprecedented. It wasn't unusual for families to keep to themselves. But with three children, didn't they ever want to play outside? When one neighbor woman looked over at the Mudhouse Mansion through her bedroom window a couple weeks after the family moved in, she saw who she thought was the mother, dressed all in white, standing in the second floor window. She found it odd how she just stood there, not moving, staring back at her. And her stare seemed anything but friendly. She didn't like the way the woman looking back at her was making her feel. The neighbor started to wonder if she'd done something to offend this woman, or if the woman was just angry for some reason. When the neighbor looked again the following day, the figure back in that window in the same position. This neighbor eventually got so creeped out that she left her house, walked across the field to the Mudhouse Mansion, knocked on the front door, resolving to just apologize for whatever she may have done. And soon, as soon as her hand made contact with the wood, she heard an angry, bellowing voice from inside scream, LEAVE! NEVER COME BACK! Resolving never to have anything to do with this new, crazy neighbor again, the woman fled back to her house. When she told her husband about it, he insisted that she call the police. And that's what she did. And what the police found would give this neighbor woman nightmares. Upon entering the home, the police found the entire family hanging from the ceiling, all of them dressed in white. The autopsy found that they had been dead for over two weeks, since the day they moved into the house. And investigators found no evidence that anyone had been inside since their deaths. The wife understandably freaked out. She wanted to move away from the area, convinced that her knocking on the door had tampered with some strange dark energy. But her husband said that wasn't an option. 
They weren't going to move out of their home just because some people had died in the one next door, however mysterious it might be. Besides, he tried to convince her the bodies were all gone now. Whatever supposed dark energy may have been over there surely now left with their remains. His wife tried her best to get over what she'd experienced, but she couldn't. Her eyes kept being drawn back to that window where she saw the woman, or rather, the woman's ghost. Like a magnet pulling her eyes towards it, she'd find herself standing in front of her window, not remembering how she got there, staring at the old tragic home, the last couple of hours a blur. And sometimes she swore she heard a whisper, Do you see me now? The last time this happened, she didn't know what to say, but yes. The voice replied, Do you see what I did to them? And then in the mansion's window, the figure would reappear, dressed all in white. The woman hoped she was hallucinating. She hoped her mind was just remembering the figure she'd seen once before. But then this mysterious woman in white slowly, jerkily did something she never saw her do the first time. She'd lift up her hand as though she were a marionette and smear it across the glass. And the hand that was covered in blood now covered the window in it. Then in her own reflection, the neighbor woman's hand would also be covered in blood. The last night she did this, the woman was then found by her husband, screaming at the top of her lungs, her hands covered in her own blood, the window broken in front of her. When he asked her if she smashed the window, all she could say was, It was her! She killed them! She killed them! Of course he didn't believe her, and when she couldn't let go of this claim, when she spiraled into insanity, unable to sleep, unable to stop talking about the woman in white who'd killed her family, the wife was institutionalized and never came back home. And now locals say that, right before the house was demolished, you could still sometimes see the figure of the woman that she watched, dressed all in white, standing motionless in a second floor window. Now that the house is in rubble, perhaps the hauntings are done and over with. Or perhaps now, sometimes when passing by the Mudhouse Mansion on the highway, travelers still see something out of the corner of their eyes. Maybe a trick of light and shadow. Maybe a bloody woman in white, waiting for a new home to be built and someone new to terrorize. Bah. What a weird thing. Mm -hmm. That ending? That's so Mm -hmm. bizarre. Mm Mm-hmm. Weird little recurring thing that supposedly happened. Yeah. Well, how how did that ghost Uh. get the woman across the street to, or across the way to punch out the window and, ugh? Don't know. My God. If our, if any of our neighbors are brutally murdered. Yeah. I want to leave. I don't want (laughs) to stay. Not, not only because of that story, but because, yeah. okay, mm-hmm. A, press. The, the, uh, there will be like a lot of news cameras around okay. all the time. I don't want to talk about it because I, don't, I feel like the more you talk about it, maybe and then it could come into your house. I don't want to invite that spirit into our house. I feel like spirits could jump from one house to another. Mm. I just, it feels too close. <laughs> Uh, look how creepy this house uh, did look. Just like out on this field. Oh, fuck that. I know. Oh, it, my God. It would have been a great place to film uh, some horror movie. Maybe one was filmed there. I don't know. I mean. I doubt it, but man. They should have just let uh, a uh, ghost investigation crew go in there. Right. Come I, on. I mean, it was pretty beat up if I, in, inside. Here's a uh, picture, interior uh, picture of the Mudhouse Mansion. Oh, I mean, yeah. Shot yeah. to shit. Shot to shit. And this next one uh, shows uh, even more kind of destruction inside. Yeah. And it doesn't even feel like, oh, once upon a time it was beautiful. Nope. I hate everything about this house. (laughs) Uh, And then here's uh, one more picture of it uh, being torn down right before the final walls fell over. Wow. Got that big cat in there just knocking shit down. I bet it was expensive to even attempt to keep it safe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, out in the middle of nowhere like that. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested if they build another property or a house on the grounds. Not if they're smart. And uh, see if like more stories pop up. Yeah. What? No. Why would you do that? Yeah. I don't know what their plans are. If you want to test that theory, build like a freaking shack. You know what I mean? Like, don't waste your money. <laughs> so you can have like a haunted a shed? Well, just like, why waste your money? Because then if you right. build it, if you build it, they will come. Put an and, RV on there. And then if it comes, then you can just tear that shed down. Mm-hmm. Right? As opposed to like investing your eff- your time and money and efforts into this house we're going to live in that we hope yeah. to God isn't haunted. Get out of here. Just Are you an, nuts? Just get, get an old RV, put it mm-hmm. out there. That's not creepy. And just rent it out to somebody that you don't really care about. Okay. They could be the guinea pig. I've got some people. Mm-hmm. Give them mm-hmm. a great deal. Mm-hmm. And then just, me, you know, and then just me, check in with them every month. You. Hey, how's things going over there? Yeah. How, how's my help? You met that neighbor in white, uh, the lady in white, oh the neighbor yet? See if she shows up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if our neighbors are brutally murdered, can we leave? What do you think? <laughs> can we leave? I mean, it's probably going to, we're probably not going to get the equity, you know? Mm, right. For. Damn it. Got to wait till it blows over. Property value is probably going to go down a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Mm-hmm. But maybe if it's like a few houses down. Mm, yeah, maybe. Then we could like peace out. 
Or, I mean, there's the other angle that, um, especially, you know, with this podcast, we then manufacture a crazy haunting and a whole story around it. And then we sell the house to a diehard creep. Oh. Somebody who wants to live with, uh, you know, murderous or a murdered ghost, an angry ghost. And then the, the maybe they'll also say things like, and leave leave some of your belongings behind. Mm, okay. Because they're like also creepy that way. Right. They love us. Mm. They want our house. They want the ghost. They, they want the whole scared to death experience. Right. So then maybe we get way more oh than God. list value. Oh my God. Maybe we keep the house fully furnished the way it is. And mm -hmm. then we like talk about how haunted it is. And then we like Airbnb it. Like <laughs> that's the play. haunted Airbnb. Okay, that's the play. Okay, okay. so right, right. if any so, of our neighbors are brutally murdered, okay. that's the plan we kick off. Or, I mean, we do sometimes have a ghost there, so we could just oh, really I thought, like. I thought when you paused, it up. you were going to say, or we murder somebody. <laughs> I mean, there are some people <laughs> that I don't care for, but I don't know that murder is an option for me. Okay, yeah, I think fair. my conscience. I, yeah, I think I'd go crazy. We have a couple of annoying neighbors, but but none that are you know so annoying that. Feel like they deserve to be murdered. No, I mean, there's one that I like really, really, I really, really don't, don't care like, for. But but I still probably don't want him murdered. No, I mean, like all in all, just cranky, just a cranky guy. Oh, I think we're talking about two different people. Oh, oh, okay. Oh no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Are, not not that cranky guy. Are we are we talking about the one that uh, rallies all the troops together for a singular cause? Oh, that's the guy I like the least. Ah, I was not thinking of the same guy. Okay, okay. Well, there's always one neighborhood stinker. <laughs> Just really has got a, ugh. this guy that moved into our neighborhood is like, everybody got along until this guy came along. Yeah, that's true. And then he decided to be the one to be divisive in the neighborhood. It's like, what are you doing? This is mm -hmm. a freaking neighborhood. This is not like yeah. city council. Yeah. I yeah. don't like this guy. He did politicize the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. It's just unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And I don't even, it was so weird how he did it. Yeah. It's it not that he did it. It's how he did it. Right. And then like. The not about who he was even, not about who he was into, about just about the way he conducted himself. Yeah, it's like with it was interesting. It's like, oh, you, you now you can't wave at me. Okay, mm -hmm. you weirdo. Yeah, weirdo. Mm -hmm. Not okay. And also, when we were putting up, I don't know. I think we were. Oh, we were painting the house. His wife walked over. Why are you painting your house that color? And I was like, mm -hmm. excuse me. First of all, get the fuck off my property. <laughs> Second of all, like. Why do you drive a fucking ugly car? I don't know. Like, that's wow. such a weird, like, personal thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Why would you say that? Yeah. Oh, as we're spending, like, money to, like, make our house look nicer, which raises the value of your home, you asshole. Yeah, I didn't know you had quite that much anger towards it. Well, me. I just think it's such a weird thing. I would mm -hmm. never. You know, okay. I would never. I pick up what you're putting down. I'll okay. kill him. Okay. Thank you. I got that's, it. That's, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Mm -hmm. You weren't supposed to say it, though, oh. because now we have it We'll have to edit recorded. that part out. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Ah, ah jokes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. ah, just a okay. big old joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What a way to start off 2022. <laughs> just lots of anger. <laughs> but just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. So I was telling you at the at the top of the show, is yeah. your neck still hurt? Yeah. It's, it's, it's way better than it used to be, though. Okay. And Dan really jacked up his neck like three weeks ago. Uh, yeah, it's like, it's like two, two weeks. It's, it's been almost two weeks, actually. But yeah, hmm. it's, it's it's coming around. It's okay. coming around. Loosen it up a little bit more each day. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, so I was saying in this story, it's this this mom thinks that she has a lucid dream, like a very fucking scary, awful, but then is like, oh God, okay, God, that was just a dream. But then her kid says something that's like, oh my God, maybe I wasn't dreaming. Like maybe that really happened. Or they're having a shared dream, but I don't think... Okay. I don't think so. Okay. 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 Do you have a squish squish? I do. I do. I have this little black and white Layla figure with her little red heart. Oh, uh, the black one is my favorite one. Mm -hmm. I like it better than the brown one. It's a. It's just so it's, cute. It's a better, better color configuration. Yeah, it's cute and also cool. It it kind of reminds me of little, Nightmare Before Christmas. I think that's oh, why yeah. I like a it. Tim Burtony. Oh, we should watch that. Yes, we should. Watch it's it. A great so one. long. Okay. Anyways. Here we go. This story, man, it like messed with me. I was a little bit afraid to go to sleep because I I just think that like my dreams are separate of my reality. Yeah. But this made me feel very different. And I'm like, oh, God, what if your dreams could come true? Oh, man. Is this, is this Freddy Krueger-ish? Uh, I'll let you decide. Okay. Okay. Hey, scared to death family. I've been on the fence about sending this story in since August because I'm seriously so freaked out about it. I just listened to the imposter episode and I'm only sending this in because the queen asked for stories similar to what she read there. My family and I live in upstate New York. We have two kids, six and four, and with all of the thunderstorms we've had this summer, there have been lots of girls only campouts with mom while dad takes the couch with our pup. 
One night, the weather was particularly bad. Branches flew into the sides of our house and we lost power. When the lights went out, the kids made their way into our room. The thunder was starting to shake our house and my husband eventually went to the living room to calm our dog down. The kids and I managed to fall asleep before the storm passed. I woke up to a weather alert the next morning that another storm was coming in and so I sleepily went to the enclosed porch to make sure the windows were closed. Our house is about 100 years old, so they tend to unlatch during storms. When I looked out of one of the windows, I noticed there was a man at the house next door. He was just standing there. I had never seen someone stand so still with wind whipping around like it was. He suddenly turned and met my eyes and his gaze made me want to vomit. I hurried to close the curtain and made it back into the main part of the house. My husband was on the couch and I told him what I had just seen. He got up and whispered that would he that he would go get some bad juju spray. <laughs> Asshole. As he walked away, something told me to check the inside windows in the living room. And there he was. The man was in our enclosed porch, just staring at me and then grabbed something dark from behind his back. I realized it was just a black hat. After what seemed like hours, I broke free from his gaze and was finally able to turn around and face the rest of the house. There he was, inside our house. I then heard my bedroom door open. From the darkness, I saw our kids standing there, reaching out for me, beckoning me to follow. I started walking towards them, but something was off about their faces. They were stiff, and there was no light in their eyes. And that's when I noticed him, standing behind them in the dark with that smile. I shot up, gasping for air. Before I could even fully catch my breath, I checked that my kids were next to me. The power had come back on, and with the glow from the TV, I saw that they were there. They were safe. And I realized that what had happened must have been a lucid dream. It had mm -hmm. to be, right? As I laid back down, my oldest looked over at me and said, Mom, don't follow them. Don't follow the man with the smile. Hope this spooks you as much as it did <sighs> us. Love the show. Keep up the spooky work, Ash. That's creepy, Ash. Uh-huh. If, uh, like, if you haven't said anything about what you just saw to your kids... And then one kid is like, don't follow them. Don't follow, like, right, right after all that. The man with the smile. Yeah, that's really creepy. You know? Th that is, it does remind me, I forgot about that. It's been so long since I've had one of these. Uh -huh. I, th I think maybe not since I was a kid. But have you ever had that where you're, um, I think it's pretty common, but you're having like a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And then in the nightmare, you wake up. Oh, it, yeah. Right in your uh, surroundings. Mm -hmm. And you think that you're awake. Mm -hmm. And then you go right back into another nightmare kind of world and yeah. then wake up. And then when you wake up that second you're like, time, you're like, am I awake? I know. Like, it's like this weird, like you are awake now, but it still feels like a little bit of like residual dream world. That is such a... Um, just surreal kind unnerving. of unnerving, like unnerving, yeah, feeling, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That hasn't happened to me in a really long time. Those are the worst nightmares. I feel like sometime within the last year, I had possibly my first lucid dream or lucid dream that I was aware of, mm -hmm. because it, it sort of feels like that, where you feel like you're, uh, you feel like you've woken up, yeah, and it feels like you're in your surroundings. But and, but I did. I remember having this conscious moment of like, oh, I'm still sleeping, and then like just close your eyes, and go back to sleep. But right. I was awake. Right. It was like I was yeah. coming yeah, out of yeah, it entirely, yeah. but it's this weird, like in between dream reality state. Yeah. I wasn't awake in my dream. I was awake in real life, but I thought it was the inverse of that. Yeah. 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 Which was weird. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And trippy. Yeah, and I wasn't high or anything. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know why that happened. <laughs> I know. It's, uh, it's what goes on with our brains to create those like little in between kind of, uh, that like in between consciousness, I don't know. It's yeah, weird. Well, it's a glitch of sorts. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Because have, you have whatever part of your brain's firing when you're in dreams, uh, dream state. Oh man, what if that like got really messed up? Oh my god, what if someone flipped the wrong switch? God, that's a crazy thing. I, I haven't ever looked that up. But basically, like whatever part of your brain is in that kind of dream consciousness mm -hmm. doesn't turn off. So like, but like, like, could you be awake and have that part of your brain also firing? So basically like you're permanently hallucinating. I mean, well, maybe I'm sure that that's some sort of mental illness. Yeah. Ah, Th that man. might be like, kind of like schizophrenia. Yeah. Like, like, like if they're both on at the same time. Yeah. So you're having dream imagery and real life imagery blended. Well, sure. So you're having hallucinations. R right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think Yeek. that is a very dumbed down, like just conversational version of some sort of technical mental health disorder. I'm Maybe. certain of it. Yikes. Or, or I mean, I'm not certain of it, but it feels like that it would feels be, like it could be yeah. plausible. Interesting. Well, glad I don't have that thing that, Ooh. if it does exist. Oh man, I wonder if that's a little bit like Alzheimer's. 
how you just kind of mm-hmm. like in and out of what is reality and what is not. I don't know. Or schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. What's the other one? What do, what do we call multiple personality disorder now? Uh, I think it's dissociative. like dissociative identity disorder, DID. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that would be, it would be all kind of in that world. Yeah, I don't know. Because DID is, there's some hallucinating, hallucinating there. I can't remember if there is or not. Well, I think it is because it's like a... Schizophrenia there is. Schizophrenia yeah. is you have auditory hallucinations and you can't have visual hallucinations as well. But DID... Well, I just think of DID because then it's like uh, some in a dream, sometimes you think you're yourself. Sometimes you dream mm. of being someone else. I wonder if it's just part of the same... A, a same part of the brain that doesn't fire properly. I don't know. I don't know. Well, <laughs> let me know what you find out. <laughs> uh, okay. And so then I did say like our, our next story had a new kind of ghost that I'd never heard of a house ghost. So not, I mean, yes, this is a haunted house, yeah. but uh, at the end of the story, he goes on to explain that like, he was like, what kind of ghost is this? It doesn't seem like a normal ghost. It yeah. does some research and found house ghost, which I, a brief search, I couldn't find anything, but that doesn't mean much of anything. Uh, but it's like, if you have a house ghost, they generally pick a family that is like nice, has a nice home, and they're kind of there as like a protective guiding spirit. Okay. But when they leave and or question mark, you leave. Yeah. It can then cause a series of unfortunate events. Like it, it's no longer nice. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Okay, okay. It was a very interesting uh, story. I think there are similar um, stories like like that. There, there, we, there we have talked about things not by that exact name, but um, in Asia, where it's like uh, people have shrines to spirits oh, that yeah. like uh, of ancestors that are like or or uh, non ancestor spirits yeah. that are in this house, and sometimes there's like protective spirits that will guard the house. Mm-hmm. But if you don't pay the proper tribute, mm-hmm. don't make the proper like sacrifices, yeah, they get angry that. and they will turn. We've talked about things like that. Yeah, yeah. I actually didn't make mm-hmm. that connection. So n- not the not the scariest story, but definitely yeah. I found this story to be really uh, fascinating and just definitely worth our time. Okay. Okay. So let's find out what's going on here. Hello, Mistress Colonel Whiskle, Cor- Colonel Whiskerhorn, and Reverend Doctor H. C. Rubble. Hilarious. That's Joe. Mm-hmm. My name is Tristan, and I want to start by saying, "Scared to Death" is the first podcast I ever listened to. Yes. I had always assumed podcasts were for hipsters with algae smoothies and Crocs. Algae smoothies yeah. and Crocs. That's quite that, the combo. Very, very specific. Yeah. Uh, is that a hipster or just a dork? <laughs> well, Crocs are really... Oh, that's right. I forget that Crocs are cool now. Cro- Crocs I grew, are cool I grew up thinking that they were uh, dorky for so long, it's hard for my brain to accept that they're cool now. Make that shift. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, found you all through the Pandora app around episode four. I liked oh. how it was billed as a husband trying to scare the crap out of his wife. And I decided to give it a try. If I didn't like it, I'd be done with podcasts. Needless huh? to say, I absolutely loved it. I listened to the whole fourth one on the way to see my mom after work. When I arrived to check on her, I showed her what I had found. Her being a huge creeper, she loved <laughs> it too. And we caught up on the first three episodes right then and there. It immediately became our thing to do together every week. I lost her right before COVID Uh, started, but it feels like she's still watching with me every week. I can still hear her saying, oh, I don't like that word every time a GTFO is uttered. (laughs) I I want to thank you for the great excuse to hang around with my mom a bit longer Uh, than normal. Now on to my story. My family was always very religious and superstitious. An odd combo, I know. My mother always said she trusted that that her hippie vibes could... Uh, She could use them to tell just upon meeting someone what kind of person they were. I always understood this because the first time I meet someone in person, I always get an image of an animal in my head. The animals I see directly relate to the character of the person. Dogs are usually loyal and trustworthy. Any animal from the rodent family, with the exception of rabbits, are untrustworthy. Rabbits, however, tend to be kind and peaceful. Monkeys are silly and fun-loving, and the list goes on and on. My entire family has always believed in ghosts, and though my child and through my childhood, I remember getting tidbits of how to deal with the spiritual world here and there. The best advice I was ever given was by my grandmother. She said if you ever know that you are absolutely alone and you hear someone calling your name, ignore it, even mm. if it's a voice you know. If it really is a living person, they will come to you and find you. However, if it is an apparition, responding will only let them know that you can hear it. Once they know that, if they really have a pressing matter, they'll never leave you alone. I grew up on an 80-acre farm in Indiana. My family purchased and settled this land shortly after it became U.S. territory. It has an old log log cabin and a blacksmith shop on the property. 
all remnants of my settling ancestors who drained the great black swamp and turned it into fertile farmland. Needless to say, there are generations of us buried there, and we strongly believe some stayed behind to watch over us. I saw many things growing up that I could not explain, such as a voice shouting stop directly into my ear, halting my trek through the woods just in time to save me from a falling tree limb. But nothing definitive, no solid apparitions or things moving around. The most common occurrence was walking into my grandparents' house and feeling like you were surrounded by warmth, like you were being enveloped in a big, loving hug. It wasn't until I moved out on my own that I really came into contact with some definitive proof. Being young and having a good paying job, I landed a place of my own, a trailer, but the lot rent was cheap and to buy the place itself only cost me a couple thousand. And one check could pay all my bills, so hell yeah, I thought. I first lived there with my pregnant sister and her husband. The first few months in the house were quiet, and we noticed nothing odd moving in, but after my sister had the baby, things started. It all began innocuously enough. We were sitting in the living room while the baby was asleep. We were quietly talking, having a good time, while my niece took her nap. Then over the baby monitor, we noticed a creaking sound. There's a rocking chair in that bedroom next to the crib, and there was a fan to block out any noise we might make. We wondered if somehow the fan was blowing hard enough to make the rocking chair rock. However, any time any of us approached that bedroom door, the creaking would stop. Each one of us tried this and got the same results. I even tried Hmm. laying down at the end of the hall and looking under the gap of the door to see if the chair was moving. I don't know if you know this, but trailers tend to have very large gaps under the door to allow movement throughout the house. uh, Air movement throughout the house. (coughs) Excuse me. So I laid at the end of the hall trying to get a peek. And again, the creaking stopped just as I was in position to see the chair. Did it move? Did I see it coming to a stop or was it all in my head? I couldn't be sure and decided it must have been an optical illusion. We sat a little longer in the living room discussing this curiosity, when suddenly the creaking stopped all on its own. Immediately, we stopped talking and began listening. Only a second or two passed and my niece began crying, having woken up from her nap. I'll talk for a little bit while Lindsay is, uh, (laughs) she's got a a frog in the throat. I can see it. That's the worst feeling. Oh my God, it's the worst. like, please itch, go away. I know. Try and tell a story. And you fight it and my eyes are watering. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's uh, and it's terrible when you're telling a, a longer story because yeah, there's no getting around it. <laughs> Woo. This continued for a few months and eventually just became an interesting piece of mystery mystery in our house. Each time the creaking would stop just before my niece would wake up. It got to be that my sister or brother-in-law would start walking back to the bedroom as soon as the sound ceased, knowing my niece would begin to cry moment momentarily. As soon as I knew this was the only unexplainable, uh, as far as I knew, this was the only unexplainable thing going on in our home. Until one day when I was shaving my face in the bathroom with the door open. The bathroom was right next to my sister's bedroom and I saw what I thought was my sister coming out of her bedroom and going down the hall. I finished shaving and went out into the living room to find my sister and her husband there. I asked her how she had gotten into the bedroom without me seeing her. Both of them seemed very confused, and so I explained that I saw a woman that I thought was my sister walking past the bathroom door in a long white dress. My sister chuckled, saying that I must have smoked a little bit too much green, adding that, no, that wasn't me, and look, I'm not wearing a dress. Her husband, however, just smiled at me with this big shit-eating grin. So you saw her too, huh? He said with a chuckle, and then he went on to explain that he had seen a woman just like that at several different places in the house, usually when it was late at night and he was the only one up using the restroom or getting a drink of water. I saw her a few more times, but there was nothing big until my sister and her husband decided to move out and get a place of their own. And that's when the lady in white and I began to have very frequent contact. Hmm. About a month after they moved out, I had made dinner for myself and was setting the table to get ready to eat. As I brought my plate plate out to sit down, the white lady walked out of the hallway and stood in my living room. The whole atmosphere of the room changed. The room felt brighter and a little bit warmer. She stood there smiling at me. She was so clear. The lady looked like she had stolen a dress from Audrey Hepburn off the set of My Fair Lady. She had long black hair and a very kind face. After a few moments, she dissipated into nothing. Not too long after, she also began doing this every time I came home from work and at mealtime, as if greeting me and welcoming me home. It became became like having a very agreeable, out-of-the-way roommate. I never had a bad feeling around her, and after about a year, it just didn't even seem odd anymore. Then one night while I was at work, everything changed. 
I worked in a grocery store warehouse. We stored dried and canned goods, and my job was to take each store's shopping list and go up and down the aisles getting cases of product they needed to be replaced, then wrapping it up in a big sheet of plastic and shipping it out. Each of these aisles was about a tenth of a mile long and was separated into three different adjoining buildings. Needless to say, this was a huge facility. I was nearing the end of one aisle, almost all the way in the back of the building, when I felt her enter the front door. I don't know how I knew it was her, I just knew. (laughs) Something was wrong. The energy was almost malevolent. She was pissed. I was alone in the aisle, so I stopped, took off my headset, and turned to look at where I knew she would be coming from. I felt her rapidly moving through the buildings, and in a moment, she was at the far end of the aisle. When she appeared, she was not the lady I knew. She looked drenched from head to toe, the spotless white dress stained with water and mud. Her eyes looked furious. She came to me Mm. at an alarming speed, almost as if she didn't really move, but rather glitched her way down the aisle. Soon, she was right in front of me, glaring daggers. I paused for a few moments, staring back at her, stunned, wondering what had brought this on. When a coworker pulled into the beginning of the aisle, she promptly disappeared. I got back to work, turning the recent events over in my mind, trying to find an answer. She didn't appear before me the rest of the night, but as if I could feel, but it was as if I could feel her standing nearby, hating me. Things at home were not much better. The bright, warm atmosphere that had usually accompanied her now was dim and gray. Her usual greeting just became her glaring at me. And after a couple of days, I couldn't take it anymore. When she came out of the hallway to stare at me after I came home, I finally slammed the door behind me and yelled at her, What is your problem? If you have something to say, just spit it out or go away. (laughs) To my surprise, the lady turned sideways and pointed a finger down the hallway. Walking over to that side of the room, I followed where she was pointing, and it seemed to be the floor about three-fourths of the way down the hall. I went and checked the floor, and there seemed to be nothing wrong. When I told her as much, she seemed to get even more upset and disappeared with a stomp of her foot. The next few times I saw her, she was always pointing at the same spot, each time with more vigor and fury. A few weeks had passed in this way, and then I received a letter in the mail from the water company. It was a notice, letting me know there had been an unusually high usage at my place. They suggested that I check my water lines and make sure none had been broken. I'm not sure if you're familiar with trailers, but they actually sit three or four feet off the ground and have a vinyl skirt that goes around the base to hide things. Mm -hmm. So I went around to the back of the house where the water meter was, and I pulled back the skirt to find a small, steady stream of water leaking out of a pipe just past the meter. My grandpa, having been an electrician and plumber for many years, came over to help me fix it right away. I thanked him for the help, and he took me out and took him out to eat as payment. When I got home, everything was normal again. The room seemed warm and bright. The lady looked as she did before and was smiling a very kind, almost relieved smile. I came to believe she was trying to warn me about the leaky pipe, <laughs> and that's why she was wet and covered in mud. After this, began, uh, after this, I began digging around online to find out what kind of spirit she was. I mean, this just wasn't some normal haunting. She had come 40 miles away to my work to see me that night. If she was a regular spirit, that wouldn't be possible. I dug and I dug, and the closest I could come up to what is what is known as a house spirit. These spirits pick well-maintained houses with nice families to inhibit. inhabit. They have, uh, they are unusual spirits in that they bring good fortune to the people they live with and alternately disaster when they decide to leave that family. Because of this, many families who know they have one do their best to keep it happy. When I eventually moved into a better place, I invited her to come with me, (laughs) which she did. This was about 12 years ago. She's been with me ever since, and I have not seen a reoccurrence of the angry lady she once was. I suppose that it's mostly due to the fact that I give my house a once-over every month to identify issues or possible issues. Over these past few years, she's become kind of like a spirit guide. She warns me of malevolent spirits hovering around me, and sometimes she stands directly between me and them. In these years, I have found that visualization is key. As I said, I grew up in a religious family. So whenever one of these things gets too close, I close my eyes and imagine the whole house being flooded with divine light. A light that pushes all the darkness out and keeps it away. I don't know if my constant contact with her has opened the door in my mind that we previous that was previously just cracked open, or if these things, like her, are drawn to me. I did go on to get some advice from a spiritualist on this matter, and I was told that the most important thing was to not give dark entities power. As you know, it's common for hauntings to start with knocks, scratching, and whispers. These are the entities trying to get your attention. 
getting you to believe in them because if you believe in them, they can do more. You have talked from time to time about feeding entities, and yes, they can feed off tension and negative emotions. But the real source of their sustenance is belief. We all have a certain amount of psychic power whether we know it or not. The basis of this theory is that spirits are energy, and as we know, our whole thought process is based on electrical signs in our brain. The more fear you feel, the more your brain comes alive to help you monitor your surroundings. This gives spirits more ambient energy to feed off of, which in turn leads to more activity and thus more fear. Allowing yourself to get caught up in these cycles is just what they want. The best thing you can do when you find yourself in these situations is to close your eyes, calm down, and just repeat that it isn't there and it can't hurt you. Saying this mantra over and over will help you believe. As I have stated, belief is the power is power in the spirit world. And this is why cleansing rituals and exorcisms work, because people performing them usually truly believe that it holds power. Not to say there isn't some inherent effect from these items themselves, only that it is amplified by the belief of that person. I only add this because you regularly say that you don't know the rules. Well, here are a few that I have found, and I am sure there are more. This is all I have to tell, and if anything else happens, I'll send it in. Thank you for the spoops, tales of dumb fuckery, and a sucking good time. To you and all the Bad Magic crew, thank you for all you do. I'll keep trying to spread your great shows to those I know, but it seems like I'm a pretty odd duck out in my neck of the woods. Thanks again, Tristan. Thanks, Tristan. Um, yeah, interesting theories on, like, uh, you know, electrical stuff connected to the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was laughing for a little bit, just um, just the thought of, like— uh, what a what a handy ghost, like a home inspector type ghost, <laughs> like a maintenance ghost. There we go. Yeah, like, a, like exactly. Like you have your own personal maintenance ghost where you never. That's have fantastic. To, mm -hmm. Then then we wouldn't need a new roof. I would have known about the leak in the roof ages ago. Right, right. We, yeah, we just got started on that process, you know, a long time ago. You yeah, know, to fix things, you know. I'm just oh, picturing like the ghost, like like was wet to show that there was like a plumbing leak. Uh -huh. Now I'm picturing like uh, the ghost um, shows up, like uh, I think it was like Yahoo Serious from this crazy, like the like they stuck their finger in a light socket and your hair goes all over crazy. Right. Like the ghost just appears, like sparks shooting out of its head. And, you have an you know, electrical it, issue. Mm -hmm, you have an electrical issue. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. What happens if um, the ghost shows up and they're like fiery, like they're like on fire? Well, that could be a more serious electrical issue. Uh -huh. you know, you that could a, be like a heating issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, okay. you, if the ghost shows up and uh, looks like really sleepy, mm -hmm. you have a gas leak. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Okay. If the ghost shows up and they're like really frigid looking, you might have an issue with like- With your heater, your furnace? Or, or your AC. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You okay. know, mm -hmm. just like, because that, that could be like an indicator either way. Like, I'm so cold because the heater's not working. Or, right. oh, I'm so cold. The AC is too powerful. If the ghost shows up with like a rotting corpse with like bugs getting, going like in and out of its head, like yeah. really nasty, check for termites. Oh my God, this is great. Mm -hmm. This is great. Like if the ghost shows up with like um, little pieces of cheese, you know you have a mouse yeah, problem. Yeah, you have mice in the walls. <laughs> This is great. We got to get right. one of these. I was I was also picturing the ghost like dancing around with like mouse traps on all of its fingers. Just, ah, 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 ooh, ah, ah. And then it's like, okay, you know, got to get the mice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I loved this um, story. I know it wasn't actually like really scary in any way, but mm -hmm. I thought it was a great way to start off the year of like, okay, yeah. let's take stock. Like, you know, what is going on in your house? Yep. Get, be connected with it and then, you know, ignore it. Cleanse your house. I mean, at the beginning of the year, so many of us set intentions for the next year. Like yeah. I, t I tend to do it more around my birthday. Like that's mm -hmm. how my year to year. But I think, you know, this is a time to like start fresh. This is when mm -hmm. people are like, okay, I'm going to go to the gym this year, whatever. Yeah. Right. It's the, it's the same tropes every year. And I think that one thing that we forget about often is that, you know, our home is our supposed to be our sanctuary. It's supposed to be like yeah. the place that we feel the safest and the most loved and the most valued and secure mm -hmm. and all of that. And if there's any, bad energy in your house whether it be from a spirit or just from like having people in your house over the holidays people do come with their own energy it's like just clear it out get a, a fresh start burn mm -hmm. some candles burn some palo santo and just like you can smoke cleanse your house and say some some prayers or mantras or whatever and just yeah put yourself and your family in a good position for get, a great year get that dark uncle energy out of your house yeah well why is it always the uncle oh my god why <laughs> i had two of them get that weird aunt Aunt, oh aunt energy oh my god out of your house no i have two creepy uncles in my life man <laughs> Ugh. the one like good lord oh creepy uncles it's like nice leather pants I'm like you're fucking disgusting you're my uncle yeah well and he married in after my one uncle passed oh. away so it like made it even creepier than like you don't fucking know me talk to me like that <laughs>
<laughs> you want to do some uh, Annabelle uh, thank yous? Sure. I would love to thank the following Annabelles for helping us continue to do what we do. Beth and Jake. Molly Nordenstrom. Ooh, Derek? D-E-R-A-E-G. D-E-R. A-E-G. A-E-G. Dreg? Dreg. Dreg. Matt Aguilar. Uh. Rochelle Fowley. Jasmine Herrera. Tiffany Vassan. Vassanen. I don't know. Sorry, that was, that was a tough one. Dario Rivera. Mason Kemp. Laura Blair. Haley Bossman. Tara Waldrop. Montana. Renee Malden. Rob Lanto. Teresa Combs. Jennifer McElligat. Nathan Ward, Leslie Hammonds, hey Leslie, mm-hmm. Raz Gus, Cody, Casey Nicole, Tara Chipman, Summer Wolf, and Michaela. Nice. I have Deli Belly. Oh my God, that's so cute. That might, I'm not sure if that's a birth name or not. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Gerald Spawn, Shane Westland, Sky Conkle. Jennifer Groves, Lord Alex Von Bartley. Oh my God, that reminds me of this guy that I had a one night stand with so many moons ago. Okay. David Quinney Jr. the <laughs> third. That, like th- that name okay. will live in infamy with my friends forever. They're like, hey, remember? I'm like, yeah, because that name was ridiculous. Uh, Zia, Zaya, Zaya Marie, uh, Ams, probably like, maybe like Amber, Melissa Newton, oh, yeah. Kayla Bynum, uh, Shaylin, Danny Simpson, Ashton. Uh, McCombs, Elizabeth Whitlow, uh, Joshua Borch or Borchart, Heather Ernst uh, Pascarella, <laughs> just one word, hilarious. Nice. Sweet. Uh, Megan Lord, Jeremy Hater, or yeah, Hater, uh, Rick Turner, Miranda, ba- Miranda, 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 there we go, Balk. Oh my gosh. Summer Carney, Brian, uh, Angelica Perez, Jody Risnacki. I know the names were so hard this week. Wow, I, yeah. I, I didn't want to give them all to you because I was like, yeah, 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 I mm-hmm. will never get through it. And names, it's like, uh, for, it's funny. We haven't gotten, I mean, one of these messages in a long time. But uh, every once in a while you get a message like, oh, I can't believe, like, how disrespectful to mess up somebody's names. Read a fucking hundred names. Just pick, like, a random hundred names and you're like, oh, oh shit. Just open up. Oh, people don't really get the newspaper anymore. But yeah. just Go to the obituary section, and if huh? you can say all the names in the obituaries, then you're better than us. And I, and I, but like newer, like younger people's names. Oh yeah. Because then because we've just been really making this shit oh, up. Oh yeah. At some point, like in the '60s or '70s, mm-hmm. like just parents, it felt like collectively we were just like, ah, fuck it. Yeah. We're, we're just gonna like, and then it just gotten weirder since. I love it. Where it's just like, I'm just gonna name my kid, and not only what cracks me up is it's not only come up with new names, mm-hmm. but just throw any spelling rules completely out the window. I know. You know, I like I like Y's and Z's. You know, like or like like what you did, e. or you know, but like but like yeah, all these yeah. crazy arrangements. Well, the pendulum always so it's swings never back. Disre- it's never disrespectful. The pendulum always swings back. So eventually, yeah. I think we'll just get back to like oh yeah, be- John, Elizabeth, Shirley, mm-hmm. Art, Sue. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Bertha. <laughs> yep. Norman. Oh my God. Shelley. Yep. Oh. Just be just standard names. My aunt did the most obnoxious thing with her kids. Shelly, Kelly, Tony, and Vince. Okay. Shelly, Kelly, Tony, and Vince. Okay. Okay. Shelly, E Y, Kelly, just Y. So you were. Come on, constant, you gotta keep it consistent. It's like, Judy, come on. And it, to this day, I'm like, which one of you is the E Y and which one of you is the Y? Right. And they are like, I know. Ugh. I know. So funny. Okay. Just some spoopy shout outs. I do. A lot of anniversaries this month. Uh, to Asia from Caleb, happy anniversary. Love you. <laughs> to Lauren from Trevor, also happy anniversary. Love you. And again, to Stephanie from Taylor, also happy anniversary <laughs> and love you. Uh, to Anthony from Michaela, love you. And to Sam from Sam, happy birthday. I wish one of those uh, happy anniversaries like was like, but not love you. Happy anniversary. Don't love you. Oh, man. But... Still want a happy anniversary. Because because they want to get some? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, that is our show. Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith, Liz Hernandez for their work on social media. To Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Thank you to Zach Flannery for producing, directing today. Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, and to book editor Drew Atana for helping to format the listener stories each week. Thank you to producer Olivia Lee for finding today's first story, Sophie Evans for finding the second. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps, and peepers. Happy New Year, and hope you were scared to death. Bye! 
If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within, scared to death. Add Magic Productions.